So, um, real, real quickly, thank you very much uh, for, for tolerating me this morning. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Skinner for asking me to come by this morning. I'm looking forward to our discussion over the next hour. I've had some of you before. There are some familiar faces in the crowd um, and a lot of new faces as well. Really briefly, who am I? Because you might not know who I am. Uh, I'm not sure I know who I am, but if I had to break myself down here, again, my name is Adam Crowley. I'm an assistant professor here at Hudson University, and I've taught here since 2007, which seems like a long time ago now, and I think that's when most of you guys probably began. When did you, when did you come into school here? What, when, did you, when did you matriculate, is the, the word, begin here? Fall 2007. Fall 2007? Okay, so we've been here about the same period of time, so we've seen a lot of changes here over the past, uh, past few years, a lot of really positive change on this campus over the past four or so years. I am an English teacher, uh, an English professor, and I study what's known as narratology, which is probably a new word. Um, narratology, uh, which is the science of narrative, and I'm not going to bore you with that today because I'm sure no one got out of bed this morning and thought, oh good, narratology day. Uh, so we won't talk about that. Um, if you were going to refer to someone who studies narratology, you would refer to them as a narratologist which sounds like a mean thing to call somebody, but it's, but it's not. So here's a little basic information about me. What are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to be thinking about um, the importance of literature in professional life. And this is a topic that um, kind of self-selects its audience because you either care about literature or you don't. And I'm not here today to persuade you to care about literature you're adults, you're graduating from college, you either do or you don't, and the decision to love reading um, and critical thinking has probably already been made for many of you um, if you do not um, care much for reading or critical thinking, you know, that has natural consequences as well. But I'm not here to persuade you, I want to talk about why I think it's important, I want to talk about how I think it might be useful to you, um, but I won't be trying to persuade you, okay, I just want to make that clear right off the bat. Um, a way for us to think about this presentation, which will happen over the next 40 or 50 minutes, is that there are essentially three parts to it. We'll be thinking about what literature is. Um, from my conversations with sophomores here, I know very few people on campus have a real solid definition, so I'm assuming we're all kind of in the same boat. What does that word mean to you? And we'll figure that out in a second. Then we're going to think about the importance of literature uh, in professional life. And I hope if we have some time to end with a few comments on the Western tradition and your place in it, which can be a very motivating thing I have found for professionals to consider. So that's where we're going over the next 40 or 50 minutes. And if there are questions, please ask. Please do ask. i um, more than happy to stop along the way and answer some questions. So one of the first things we need to think about this morning is that word literature. What is literature? And do we know what that word means? Do we have a working definition for this concept? So what I'd like you to do, maybe uh, if you don't already have your notebook out, you can actually write this right on the handout um, on the slide that says what is literature or right next to that slide. I'd like you to take a few minutes and work up a definition for yourself. And I'm not looking for what I would consider to be the right definition or the definition that you can probably see if you skip ahead in the handout. Uh, but if someone said to you, what is literature? How would you respond? Understanding that it's perfectly fine to say you don't know. That's, honesty is always the best policy. So if you don't know, that's fine. If you think you have some, some guess, that's fine as well. So just take a minute or two. How would we answer that question? Is, what is literature? How would we define it? What are some answers floating around the world? Yes. Yeah. Uh, writing that tells and expresses a story of some form in good detail. Right, okay. Writing that expresses a story of some form in good detail? Is that good what you detail. said? Great detail. Great detail. Good. Not just good detail. Great detail. All right. There's one definition for literature. How about somebody else? What did you write down? Yes. I said it's a written piece of work expressing an author's thoughts or ideas could be either fictional or factual. Okay, a written piece of work expressing an author's ideas could be either fictional or factual. Okay, sounds pretty good. Other definitions floating around. Let's try to get two more good ones. Yeah. I said uh, something that is read to further knowledge about something else. Okay, something that is that is read to further knowledge about something else. Good. Somebody else. Let's get one more definition. 
Yes? You said uh, words of thought that might shape one's imagination. Words of thought that might shape one's imagination. Okay. Okay, good. These are all good places to start. How many of you don't have an answer or were confused about how to answer? Found it to be a difficult question. Or, or let me phrase it another way. How many of you are uncertain about the definition you just wrote down? Couple of hands. The rest are pretty certain. Okay, well that's good to hear. Um, these definitions might be a good place to begin, but what you can probably hear from the different people in the room is that we're coming from different places. We have different ideas. So we're going to kind of settle on one definition for today that we can all agree on. You may not agree on it um, beyond this classroom, but it will help shape our conversation today. So we're going to have a definition for literature today, and as we think about it, we'll guide our conversation. And the definition is this. Literature is written work critical of the human condition. Okay? Literature is written work critical of the human condition. It is about, very generally, life as it is lived by people, as it is experienced by people. It considers, reflects on, gives us insight into life as it is lived by other people. And it's that other people part that is going to be crucial for us today as we think about how literature is important or why literature is important in professional life. All right? Yes? Can you take questions? Absolutely. Um, could you define the word critical in that? Sure. Or what do you mean by that? Sure. Oftentimes when people hear the word critical, they might think that it has a negative connotation. So for example, don't be critical of me, right? No one wants anyone to be critical of them because then they expose our faults or our shortcomings or things like that. I'm not using it necessarily in a negative sense here. What I'm, I'm using the word in the sense that I'm paying particular attention to being descriptive of being as honestly objective as I can be about the human condition, about life it is, as it is lived. So, you, know, you might think about having a conversation uh, with your friends, right? And when friends get together, they generally talk about all the good things, you know, all things they're happy about. Um, unless they're very, very um, either narcissistic or very low self-esteem, they're probably not just talking about their shortcomings all the time. So I don't want to think about critical in a bad sense. I want to think about critical as in I'm paying detail, to, I'm paying, excuse me, extensive uh, 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 attention to what's going on around me and describing it the best that I can. Okay, what's the experience of a relationship? Everyone probably knows what the experience of a good relationship is. How many of you would, would raise your hand and would say, yes, I know what the experience of a good relationship is? Oh, no, no one? Okay, a few, a few of us. Okay. And you probably also know the experience of a bad relationship. How many of you would say you know the experience of a bad relationship? Similar number of people. Okay, so you know that experience, right? Um, it's the ability to put that into words, to describe, to explain, to communicate, to share that knowledge with other people that makes a work a piece of literature. Okay, and there's obviously, there's more to it than that. But that's a place for us to begin. Does that make some sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. So now that we've thought a little bit about what literature is, let's think about literature and professional life and how these things are related. This is the argument I am going to make today. Um, and English teachers make arguments all the time. We're one of the few people that get paid just to make arguments. And at the end of today, you can agree with me, you can disagree with me, that's, that's up to you. But I'm going to make an argument today. The argument that I'm going to make today is this. And the argument is this. Literature is an excellent tool for representing the fundamental social conditions that shape the professional world. Okay? That's, that's what I'm going to say. It's much more than that. But in terms of your education, this course, where you're going, what is literature, why is it important, it's an excellent tool for representing the fundamental social conditions that shape the professional world. And now I'm going to defend that argument over the next 20 or so minutes. I have several claims that I'm going to make today in support of that argument. And I hope that by making these claims and explaining these claims, I can persuade you to believe what I believe. So literature is an excellent tool for representing the fundamental social conditions that shape the professional world. My first claim today is that personal experience, your personal experience, is always limited. And that might sound counterintuitive to you. 
personal experience doesn't limit me. It is what I do. It's who I am. I'm going to argue this morning that personal experience is always limited. Here's my evidence for that. Everybody in this room is an individual, I hope. Okay? There aren't any Siamese twins maybe hidden in the room. I don't know. But everybody in this room is an individual. You are you. And as such, you have distinctive characteristics that make you who you are. Okay? That's what makes you an individual. These characteristics correspond to a number of categories. And that's what I want to talk about right now, is you. So it's a pretty interesting lecture because it's all about you. Okay? Um, let's, let's play a game here. You have limiting factors, I have limiting factors, and they include the following. There are more. Your age, your gender, your ethnicity, your marital status, your children, your sexual orientation, your salary, your religious affiliation, pet ownership, you have a lot of cats, dogs, parakeets, whatever, running around at home, and your political leanings. All of these things are details that, that describe who you are in society. And so what I'd like you to do is let's just take a couple of minutes and I'd like you to kind of tick off these, not tick off, that sounds like I'm saying get them upset. What I want you to do is give yourself a little bit of description in your journal or on that paper. Fill in these categories. What is your age? What is your ethnicity? What is your marital status? Fill it out as best you can. Think about this for a second. And some of you, you know, it's perfectly fine if you don't identify with one of these categories. And I'm certainly not going to collect this and grade you on it. Uh, but we need to think about these characteristics for a minute. So, we have these characteristics that define us in society. And they define who we are in society. And I make a distinction there because you are, of course, who you are personally. I'm not telling you who you are personally, but you have these characteristics, these qualities that put you in a certain place in society. Let's talk a little bit about these. Does anybody want to talk about how they filled out some of those categories? What did you, what, what do you know about yourself in terms of your limiting social factors? It's a personal question, I know, but what would you say? You're pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Most of us, most of us would probably agree with you, Nick. Um, Nick's pretty cool. We can be in agreement with that. That should be a question on the final. Is Nick cool? Um, but not just cool. Pretty cool. Uh, but what else would we say? How do we describe ourselves? Anybody want to volunteer that? Uh, well, I just went through and answered everything there. So, 25, male, white, married. Uh, one child, heterosexual, uh, make about 30,000 a year, Christian, no pets, and fairly liberal. Okay, all right. Somebody else, how would you shake out? Yeah. Uh, I did that. Uh, 23 male, uh, Caucasian, single, none, uh, for children, uh, heterosexual, 13,000 a year, Methodist, cats, and undecided. Okay, all right. Anybody else want to join in? Yes. Um, I just said I was 22, female, white, single, no kids, straight, 15,000 a year, Catholic, no pets, but I want a boxer, and I'm a Democrat. Okay. All right. So we have these categories that, that make us who we are in society. All right. We have these categories that make us who we are in society, and we might think a little bit about why they're so important, and I'll get back to literature in a second, but we recognize that we fit into these, these different groupings, and that they make you who you are in society. Now, for you today, the most important thing to know about these things is that they impact your workplace opportunities, okay, um, which is something that might, you know, strike you as sounding unfair in your ear when I first say it, but few people would probably den deny the fact that, depending upon, you know, where you're coming from in society, has a huge impact on where did you go and where did you can get to in society. Um, is it equally easy for everybody to move towards certain types of occupations? Most reasonable educated people would argue no, it's not equally easy. There are a number of factors that complicate uh, professional life, that complicate where we end up in the job market, 
that complicate a number of things. So we might think of ourselves, and it's never a nice way necessarily to start off the day, a bright sunny day, thinking of yourself this way, but we are, we are limited in ways by our personal characteristics or these personal qualities. Okay, let me give you a concrete example of that. You might want to write these down. There's basically two very general categories that these factors are going to um, probably put you into if you're not already there in society. An economic category and what I'm going to call a familial category. Okay, and basically what that just means is you know fam a family category. Okay, very general concepts, but we might think about how where we come from is going to impact the amount of money we either earn now or will earn in the future. You're all in college, you all are about to graduate with a university degree, that will increase your ability to earn significantly over people who simply have a high school education or no education whatsoever. You'll also recognize that people who go on beyond a bachelor's degree to earn a master's degree in some category generally have the ability to earn even more. Where you're coming from the opportunities you've had for education, the opportunities you've had for social interaction, has a huge impact on the economic category you're going to end up in. Same is true of the fam your familial category, the people that you have in your life, either the people that you have you know, loving relationships with, the children that you have, the relatives that you have. These, these people you know, are going to be around you um, and impact you continually as you move on through your life. So you have these different categories that we might put you into. Why is that important? Well, there's some things we need to start thinking about in terms of who we are. One of that is that we will have some, there will be some limited movement for you within these categories, almost certainly, over the course of your life. Depending upon on where you're from, you will earn hopefully more as you get older, right? You will hopefully earn more as you get older, but you always, you may not always earn more, you may earn less. You probably will not jump 50, $100,000 up the income scale over the course of your life. Probably, probably won't. Sounds rather grim, but we need to start thinking about where we are in society. We're in a category economically. We will shift in that category. It won't be that dramatic for most of you. We might think about our family category, the people around us, people who will be around us, most of you either have families or probably want a family of some sort in the future, which doesn't need to be someone that you marry necessarily and have children with, it could simply be the community you surround yourself with, okay? But you probably have some kind of family ideal for yourself, which you will probably attain in one way or another, but which probably won't shift all that much over the course of your life. Things like divorce, obviously, and death, and these things do, do change our family categories. Well, one of the things we might recognize is that our, our factors, our, our, our identity, you know, you know, qualities, put us in some ranges that we're going to be in. So we need to get comfortable. <laughs> we need to find a way to get comfortable in these ranges. So my major claim this morning is that personal experience is always limited. And now I want to turn it over to you guys. Do you buy that or not? Does that make sense or does that not make sense? Make sense? Make sense? Anybody disagree? Probably is full of it. Get him out of the class. Break his camera. Tear for PowerPoint presentation. I mean, does that anybody? I mean, because I think we could make good arguments the other way as well. Okay. All right. So we're all down with claim one. Personal experience is always limited. Now we can move on to claim two. Here's the second major claim I'm going to make this morning, which is this: literature provides you with the experience of life beyond your cultural range. This is the key reason why literature is important today. Literature provides you with the experience of life beyond your cultural range. So we all recognize that we have limiting factors. Literature is something that lets me see beyond those, experience life beyond those, okay? And there's lots of reasons why, why we might want that. So the second major claim this morning, literature provides you with the experience of life beyond your cultural range. There are two basic values to literature. I would say, and we'll talk about them. One is entertainment, and one is guidance. This morning we're primarily going to focus on guidance. Entertainment and guidance. So when I say that one of the values of literature is entertainment, what does that mean to you? What, what do you think I mean by that? Yeah, Nick. Pleasure reading. Pleasure reading. Okay. 
What would be another way? I think that makes a lot of sense. What would be another way of answering that question? To find out about the news. Okay. Okay, so looking for information about the world that you're in, and okay, pleasure reading, yes. Um, I, I think entertainment is uh, <clears throat> rapid, wanting rapid swings of emotion. Okay, yeah, I think it's a really yeah, absolutely. Give, entertainment gives us rapid swings of emotion. It's like any roller coaster fans in here. You're braver than me. I'm no good on roller coasters, but yeah, you get on a roller coaster, you have that you know rapid, rapid change, rapid swings of emotion. So there's an entertainment value to literature, okay? And I'm not going to be commenting too much on that this morning because we all know how to have fun reading a book or, you know, finding something fun to read. But I will talk a little bit about guidance and why this is so important, okay? This is a picture, by the way, taken of um, the riots in Egypt right now. You guys know what's going on in Egypt right now? Anybody following that in the news? You really should. If you don't know, there's quite a bit going on. Anyway, literature is a means for experiencing life that is broader better and fuller, and apparently more rewarding than the lives we lead in the present. It teaches us how others live, okay? That's one of the key things you need to buy into for any conversation about literature is that it has something to offer me. If you don't buy into that, I can't persuade you this morning, I can't, I, I can't really help you this morning, okay? If you're not already in a mindset that says literature shows me a world that's better than my own. If you're totally happy with everything around you, then there's very little literature can do for you. Uh, but if you understand that you represent a limited space in a very broad and rich society that you don't have access to all the time, and you might want access to, or greater access to, then literature is important. And I'll tie this back to professionalism in a second. But anyway, guidance. Let's think about you for a second. Where are you folks from? I'm from Caribou northern part of the state, where this is normal. Uh, maybe not so for you. Um, but let's, let, let's, well, you guys can share, because I, we, we haven't all been made friends through classes yet. But where, where are you from? This is some volunteers. Where are you from? MDI. MDI. Okay, I'm going to write down MDI over here. Mount Desert Island. Someone else. I'm from Patton. You're from Patton. Creeping into northern Maine. Someone else. Searsport, New Hampshire. Connecticut. Searsport, New Hampshire. Connecticut. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Where else? How about in Maine? Anywhere, anywhere else in Maine? Yes. Ellsworth. Ellsworth. <clears throat> anywhere else in Maine? Jonesport. Jonesport. Sangerville. Jonesport. Sangerville, and so another hand? Sullivan. Sullivan, okay. A lot of little towns in Maine, little places, and other, other, other states as well. Well, you, you are all welcome here today, uh, non-Mainers and Mainers alike. Um, no, but a lot of you are from Maine. Uh, in fact, by a show of hands, how many of you are from Maine? Okay, overwhelmingly from Maine. And those of you from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Connecticut, this is also important for you to think about. Here's an argument. Um, literature and guidance, literature is valuable to people from Maine for a specific reason, one that you might not have thought about before, okay? Literature is very valuable for a very specific reason. One of the things that you've probably been told or had some, someone say to you is when you graduate, you should do what? Get out of Maine. Get out. Get out. As if the state was on fire, right? Get out of the state. Go, leave, don't come back. Why do they say that? They don't want you to be stuck here. Any other answers? Why has someone said that to you if they've ever said that to you? Because it's not, I don't want to say sheltered, but we don't, there's not a lot of exposure to different experiences here. But if you move out, you're more likely to see other things. Okay, more likely to see other things. Okay, okay. We are the least diverse state in the nation. Okay, and we are per capita the oldest state in the nation. Now, those are a couple of factors that, now, I gotta say this another way. I've lived in Maine my whole life. I love this state. So you're going to hear me say some negative things about it, but I only say the negative things about it because I like it. So it's not like I'm up here, you know, just trashing on the state of Maine because I think this is a really good place. But there's some things you need to think about as professionals. We have a hard border. You might not have heard that phrase before. We're the only state in the Union and the contiguous uh, uh, United States that only touches one other state, right, which is 
New Hampshire. So we have one state that we border, which let's be frank, is like us in a lot of ways, okay? Uh, the main New Hampshire difference is, there are slight, there are some, but they're not that significant. On the other side of us, we have an ocean and Canada, which means a couple of things. It means we don't have people or other Americans, certainly there are a lot of Canadians who move through the state, but we don't have the experience of having a lot of other Americans moving through our state. We're rural to begin with, we have a hard border, and most of us don't see many people from other parts of the state, even within the state, because it's a fairly poor state and it's expensive to travel. So you might see people within a two, two and a half hour range of you. But for example, I come from northern Maine. I have certainly been beyond Portland many times, but I can count the number of times I've visited Portland probably on two hands. Okay, and I'm 32. So we have a range within this state. We have a hard border. We have a history of what's called out-migration, and that's a word you might want to, you might want to know as well. Out-migration, which is essentially people like you taking the advice of the people who say leave. Educated people and the young leave the state. They go elsewhere to work. Okay? That's an issue. And we have long-term, what I'm going to call entrenched families. And entrenched might sound like a mean phrase. I don't mean it to sound mean. But what I mean is we have families that have been here for generations and generations and generations and generations, usually in the same town, and, and will not be leaving anytime soon. There are positive and negative aspects to this. Literature is important because it's going to be something that lets us see beyond the hard border or get beyond the hard border if we don't choose to leave. It's a way to experience the larger world, recognize that there's more going on, and participate in it intellectually, if not physically. Okay, so Maine's hard border has positive and negative connotations to it. And literature is important to us because it gives us that experience. So the major claim here is that literature provides us with experiences of life beyond our cultural range. Would we agree or disagree with that? Do you, does that make sense to you or is that... I agree. You agree with that? Okay. Why do you agree with that? Um, just because I'm a big reader too and I love learning about history and just other people's experiences mm -hmm. that expand my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts about that? I mean, if you, if you, what I'm starting to do this morning, guys, is if you really, you're limited in your characteristics, in, your, in so, social opportunity, whoever you are as an individual, of course, I'm not commenting on, but just as you are represented in society, and then if you recognize that you're in a state that has very little diversity, what are some of the implications for, of that for you going forward as a professional? What's that going to make professional life like for you, do you think? <coughs> Hard if you stay in Maine. Other thoughts? What do you imagine your professional life being like? Imagine a day of work in the future. I think it'd be kind of boring. There's not as much diversity. Mm -hmm. You're not dealing with different types. Well, you're dealing with different types of people, but mm -hmm. overall, our characteristics are probably pretty similar. As opposed to like if you're like work in a bigger city where you're dealing with much more different mm -hmm. ethnic backgrounds. Okay. Ethnic. Okay. All right. So we might think about ethnic diversity. We might also think about simple, you know, religious diversity. Or um, people coming from different nations um, with different, different cultural backgrounds. There are many different types of diversity. But absolutely, is it going to be boring? Do I want to be a professional in a boring environment? Again, I say this as someone who likes this state and is planning on staying here. Uh, but what is, what is your professional life going to be like. You need to start thinking about that if, if you haven't. So, okay, claim two. So real briefly, before we get into the rest, of the, the rest of the presentation here this morning, let's just review some of the major ideas. Literature is something that shows us life um, beyond our cultural range. We might think about the fact that it shows us a world that we may want to participate in, we may aspire to be a part of it. Also, and I haven't mentioned this yet, it also puts us in charge of the range that we want to encounter. We can select the things we want to read, and we can see the aspects of life or our culture that we might not normally um, come into contact with, but uh, might want to know more about. So it puts you in charge of a situation that you have otherwise very little control over. 
who you are in society, generally we have very little control over that. Where you live, generally we have very little control over that. But literature allows us to kind of, it's kind of like a telescope. You can point it where you, where you want it. And you can see what's there. And you, and you have that opportunity. Okay? So that leads us to the third claim. And this is one that we'll spend a few moments talking about here, but that is, that is this. Literature provides us with models for management in the workplace. Literature provides us with models for management in the workplace. For many of us, literature can serve as our very first kind of administrative training. Do you have any idea what I might mean by that before I get into it? Literature as a model for management. Literature is a model for administrative training. Someone maybe who hasn't spoken up yet this morning. What do you think I mean by that? Any ideas? I mean, Huckleberry Finn doesn't take place in an office. Yes? No, I know where I work. I have many, multiple, multiple handbooks I have to read through to learn how to run or do anything. So mm -hmm. without reading that, I won't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without literature, I'm not provided with the knowledge I need to do to do my job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What kind, very good, what kind of knowledge do you think um, generally literature can give you that would be helpful in, where you work? Um, insight on personal experiences others have had while doing a certain particular project or mm -hmm. proper ways to, to do the project to, to fulfill the, the needs of that job. Okay. Whatever is required for you to <laughs> okay, I make it a lot of sense. I'm going to kind of back you up to just thinking about the way people interact with one another in society, which can be very useful. I should actually say claim three. I knew I'd have a couple typos before I got through it. Uh, but anyway, if we think about literature as being uh, a model for management, we might think about a few things, and I have them listed on the board. Literature shows us developed or developing human beings at work and play. I teach a class called EH200 here, which is all about work and play and literature. And so it gives us insight into why it is people do the things that they do. And that's the, that can be a number one you know, reason to read literature if you've never before. Oftentimes when we read, and you're, you're encouraged to do this a lot in grade school, well how does it relate to me? How does it relate to me? Well, literature is sometimes most useful to us when it doesn't relate to us directly uh, because you have access to yourself 24 hours a day. Uh, but what you don't have access to is a broader world all the time. So it lets us see how and why people do the things they do. You may know why you do the things you do. For example, why are you guys in school right now? Anybody have an answer? I hope so because you spent a lot of money <laughs> to get to this point. Why, why, why are you in school? To get better education. To get a better education, someone else is there a way to way to phrase? Think about you. Like, why are you here? Like, let, let's get more specific. Let's get personal to you. Why are you in school? You particularly, you. What do you want out of this? Good career. Okay, a good career, education. Can you think of another reason? Anything that strikes maybe closer to home? To learn how to make a difference. To learn how to make a difference. Teach my children values. Teach your children values. Make your family proud. To make your family proud. Okay, these are all very good reasons for pursuing higher education. It may make sense to you why you do this, but just stop for a second and ask yourself this. Okay, you kind of heard some other people in the room talking, but can you simply assume that you know where you are, why everybody else is here? Can you repeat that? Sure. You know why you're here. Would it make sense for you to assume that you know why everybody else is here? No, because no, we don't know these people that well. I mean, you guys probably know each other from this semester and all the work that you've done together and will do over the next few weeks, but we would need to speak with people. We would need to learn from people. We would need to talk to people before we would have that insight. Literature shows us how and why people do the things they want to do. My second major point this morning, or maybe my major point this morning, is that because all of you guys want to get a college degree, you want to be a manager in one way or another, almost certainly. Okay, at some point in your life, you're hoping you will have the ability to organize other people in whatever field that you want to go in. Otherwise, you wouldn't need a degree. If you just wanted to be, you know, if you wanted to be at the bottom of the food chain your whole life, you wouldn't you wouldn't need a college degree. Uh, but you do have one. You're going to get one as long as you pass this class, I assume. 
Um, and uh, that's going to put you in a position where you're going to be a manager in some sense. So you need to understand why it is people do the things they do. How is that helpful to being a manager if you understand the, why it is people do the things they do? How can, that, how can those things relate, do you think? Why do you need to know the motivations people have for the actions they take? So you can get them going. You can get them going, absolutely. Your, your hat tells me that you're a Patriots fan. Is this true? Yeah. Okay. What do you think, what do you think the coaches need to know about their players for the Patriots to get them to do whatever they want them to do? Is it as easy as saying run this play or do, or, or do they have to understand who they're talking to? Well, they have to, they have to know who they're, who they're talking to and they have to know what motivates them to perform at their peak. Okay. And if they don't know that? They're not going to get the most they can out of them. Absolutely. And, and as managers, many of you will need to understand what motivates the people you work with. Literature gives us opportunities to practice, to kind of see virtually why it is people do the things they do, see the things that motivate people. That's another reason why it's important. Uh, it, yes? I was going to say, uh, I was thinking about your earlier question, if you could jump in. Sure. Because it reminded me um, about how this is going to be important and how it can help us in management. But I remember going to a, I was invited to a seminar by a friend of mine who was a professor who was presenting to high-level executives. The corporations. It's a summer course. And it's this particular course was using um, the short story uh, Bartleby and Scrivener. Oh, yeah. And using that as a template for how does this impact management. This is a story that was written in the 1800s, right? Yep. And, uh, and it was fascinating how they forced the executives mm -hmm. who were very narrow thinking to open up around this. Why does, this, why does Bartleby resist so mightily doing any work right. and drove the boss crazy and it was a perfect example of like, what you're talking about. <clears throat> Literature is helping us see another side of people motivates them. So I, I no, absolutely. And, and, and I would, I have uh, some things I'm going to recommend reading at the end. I would, Bartleby would absolutely go up there if you haven't read Bartleby the script made up by Herman Melville. Uh, it's a great story about a guy who goes to work and no matter what the boss tells him to do, his response is I prefer not to. Um, and so, but, he, but the boss never fires him, so it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. It's a great, it's a great story, uh, which, which you have a chance to read, you, you should. But yeah, absolutely, it, it provides us a roadmap for anticipating the kinds of people who are going to come into our lives, okay? And that question might not matter to you if you are really, really dedicated to being a part of an, kind of a stagnant community, um, either in a certain corner of Maine or New Hampshire or Connecticut mm -hmm. or, or Massachusetts, but many of us recognize that with globalization and continued industrialization of the third world, we are going to have more and more contact with people from places many of us probably couldn't find on a map right now. And I include myself in that. Okay? Um, not so great with maps. I know where the continents are and most of the major countries, but it breaks down pretty quickly. Um, so what I want you guys to do is to think about how literature can be helpful to us in that way. Okay? Um, a, few, a few other comments here, and more general comments maybe, and then we'll talk about some things you might want to read, which won't be an assignment, but an opportunity for pursuit. Um, literature is something that if you, if you um, are still a little bit unsure about how to approach it, you can think of it as part of the Western tradition. And I don't mean horses, I don't mean gun smoke, okay, when I say the Western tradition. Does anybody know what the Western tradition is in this room? What is the Western tradition? The way we as a country do things. I think it's a good place to start. It's a way that we as a country do things. We can expand it. We ever heard that phrase before, the Western tradition? Is it kind of like just going and getting it, getting it done? Well, that would be maybe a philosophy, I agree, under the Western tradition. We can think of the Western tradition as essentially this. About 2,500 years of thinking and philosophy and art that has defined life pretty much from Greece west <laughs> uh, to maybe Hawaii. That can give us our western uh, scope. And you are part of a civilization that has been evolving and modifying itself under certain ideas for about 2,500 years. And it goes a little bit further than that as well. Why is that important for you? Because you need to understand that your life, even in you know cold, full of snow, Maine, on Monday morning, um, on uh, early February in 2011, is is the product of human history. 
Western civilization's development, the reason that you guys are here today in the clothes that you're in, sitting in the classroom with access to technology, speaking the language that you speak, is because of the advances in civil civilization under the Western tradition that have occurred for the past 2,500 years. I'm not going to give you a history lesson. Literature is part of that. So what, this is why I'm saying this. It gives you insight into your immediate social situation, which is very useful as a professional. It also gives you insight into the history of the world that has shaped who you are, who I am, in every way we are. And the more insight you have into that, the greater you understand your culture, the greater you understand your culture, the more your range opportunities open up in terms of where you can go in society. If you understand very little about your culture and the history of yourself and the history of your, the history of your civilization, the range is very narrow. If you understand more, you have more opportunities. So that's another reason to think about why literature is important. I'm going to conclude here um, with some recommendations. There are a few books I think everybody should know by the time they graduate, and I know not everybody will. But if part of this lecture is kind of me selfishly giving you a wish list, okay? Uh, and, and this kind of thing has been done by English teachers for about 2,500 years. But if I, if I could say to you, you know, when you graduate, there are some books that you should know. Or if I were to say to you, if you've heard anything this morning that you have found interesting in any way, and wish to make literature more a part of your life, there are some books that are a good place to start. Okay, there's some books that are a good place to start. Um, Stephen King's Carrie. Have any of you guys ever read Stephen King's Carrie? Some of you are smiling, but you don't want to admit that you've read it probably. It's a great book. You should really read Carrie. If you, you'll just even see the movie, but the book's really good uh, if you've never read Carrie. It takes place very close to here. Uh, it was written very close to here. Um, and probably has high school characters in it very similar to the kinds of people you went to high school with. I know that there are a lot of characters. Like, I'm sure... Sue, Sue Snell, who's a character, was someone I went to high school with. Um, uh, anyway, good book. I like it. Pride and Prejudice. You guys ever read Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen? Yeah, what did you think? Uh, it was all right. Not my forte. Not your it was, forte? It was a good, it was a good book. Okay, okay. The movie was good. What was that? The movie was good. The movie was good? Okay, you've seen the movie version of it? Okay. Um, and again, most of these books, there are movie versions of them, but we want to push into the, the reading of it as well. But I agree, the movie version is very good. Pride and Prejudice is a great book for a number of reasons, uh, particularly if you want to think about the social factors that can limit you in society. It's really what that book's all about, overcoming those factors to the best of your ability. Have any of you guys ever read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? A few of you? Some of it. I would say it's the funniest book I've ever read. What was that? I said I read like the children's edition. The children's edition? <laughs> Yeah, that may be true for some of us. I would, if you haven't read this, I would recommend reading it very, very, very soon. Okay, it's it's a long book, but it's very funny. It's written in a very thick uh, Southern dialect, um, and you got to get over that. Um, just try reading it out loud, and you'll sound like any, any fans of The Simpsons in here. Anybody ever watched The Simpsons? You guys know Cletus on The Simpsons. You're the character Cletus, the hillbilly with the pickup truck full of kids, right? Okay. Well, it kind of kind of sounds like that. All right. So you should really read this. Song of the Lark uh, by Willa Cather is also a fantastic book about a, about a young girl uh, and her development as a musician, okay, during the 19th, I think 19th, earliest 20th century maybe. Frankenstein, I know a couple of you have read Frankenstein because you've read it with me. Anybody ever read Frankenstein? Okay, you got to do that. Before, before President Clark gives you your degree, you got to read Frankenstein. That's, that's really important, okay? You got to read that. Uh, the Invisible Man. Okay, this is a good list because very few of us have read anything off it, which is fine. What I want you to do, though, is to think about this. If you can sit here right now and say, yeah, literature is important, the next step is to say, okay, how do I make this a part of my life? What do I do to make this stuff a part of my life? If I recognize that it's going to increase my professional opportunities, if nothing else, okay? As an English teacher, you know, I would say there are vastly... There are many, many, many reasons to value literature. One of them that might relate to you this morning is that it contributes to professional life um, and your understanding of your own culture. All right, so that's pretty much all I have to say to you this morning. Um, besides this, I wish you all, first of all, I congratulate you on getting to this point in your education. So near graduation, many of you, um, and you'll be, you will be leaving here shortly with a uh, with a degree that will 
represent all the hard work that you've put into this institution and will suggest all the promise that you have in the future. Um, and so you are all to be congratulated on that in that effort. So why don't you guys give yourself a round of applause and then we can move on, all right? Congratulations. Some of you refuse to clap. Maybe you know something I don't know. All right, anyway, it's been a lot of fun talking with you guys. Uh, if there's any questions, I can answer those. Um, that would be fine. Yeah. I would just have a quick measure for those, and I know I put myself in this category when I was younger, mm -hmm. and I still struggle with today when I really want to read a book and it feels overwhelming mm -hmm. to start it. How, how does, in order not to feel paralyzed and not, and not to read, either read too much into it or, mm -hmm. or to not understand enough other guides that we could use, that the average person can use to help them if it's a book they really should read and want to read? Yeah. Um, I, 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 would, I would begin by saying I have a really deep, deep prejudice against things like cliff notes or any kind of aid that, that breaks something down for you. And this is the analogy I use. It usually grosses people out enough to make it effective. You guys know about like baby birds and nests, right? You guys picture some baby birds in a nest. Right. How does the mother bird feed the baby bird? Do you guys know that? How's that, how's that happen? What does the mother bird do? Right, goes down, grabs a worm, chews it up, and then barfs it into the baby's mouth. Okay. That's kind of how I see the notes. Uh, that's, that, that's somebody taking something, breaking it down, and then kind of dumping it on you. Um, it's somebody else's view of what the thing is. So if there's a book you're interested in, the thing to do is not to reach first for the Cliff Notes or for the Spark Notes or any of those like guides for whatever. Uh, the thing is, is to sit down and struggle. Um, if you want to run a mile and you've never run a mile before, you know, you can't watch a tape of somebody running a mile. There, there is struggle. There is intellectual struggle. Um, there is attention struggle. And if you are willing to put that in, the rewards are really great. Another less disgusting analogy that might work is you guys are all aware of like, um, you know, these old fashioned water pumps, hand water pumps. You've seen those before. They're usually red. They have a long handle. You ever use one of those? Yep. Okay. So how does that, how does that hand water pump work? What do you have to do to make it work? Right, so you go to the water pump and you pump it. Now the first time you pump, does water come flying out of it? No, what, what do you have to do? You gotta pump it. Yeah. Right, you gotta put in the effort, okay? And you put in the effort and eventually water shows up, okay? Literature's the same way. You sit down with it, it's confusing, it's, you don't know the words, you don't know the characters, you're confused. You have to understand that confusion's okay and push through it. And if you don't push through it, then you won't have access to the book. If you do push through it, then, then you will. And literature has standards for us. It challenges us. And if we run from those challenges, then we don't have access. <laughs> we don't have access to it. Just the way you know, you'll never visit another state if you're scared to leave your hometown, or scared to leave your county, or scared to leave your region. If you don't overcome those, those challenges, there is no easy road for literature. It makes demands of us. And if we don't meet those demands, then we don't have access. Um, that's an important reality, I think, of the subject. To take, in, take into consideration. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Can I just pose one for the students here? Uh, any of you, if you think back over the last few years, uh, I know you've had to read some literature, but is there any that stand out for you that, that is not, wasn't on the list of that event, but that you, you really found did guide you in some of your thinking? Could it be, I'm assuming it would be either fiction or not. Oh, yeah. Is there, is there any books that anybody would like to share that they felt like made an impact on to help them? The Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, just because I started getting into reading old literature and I found that in one of the bookstores and I bought the whole thing and I'm still trying to get through it. I'm just mm -hmm. at the fifth circle of hell mm -hmm. or uh, Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. But it's really... God, it's it's compelling me to just enjoy life and stuff because of just how much he has to see of the old heroes mm -hmm. and of what their sins were. Mm -hmm. It's quite compelling. Mm -hmm. Let me phrase it another way if there aren't a lot of answers. What's something they made you read in high school? Sennarpa. Okay. What, did you like it? It's probably the only book I remember enjoying in high school. Which one was it? Sennarpa. Oh, Sennarpa. Why, why did you like it? Mm -hmm. I don't know, it just kind of gave you a different aspect on someone else's life and how they live and mm -hmm. the, the struggles they go through compared to yours. Mm -hmm. They're vastly different. Mm -hmm. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Well, the Odyssey is a good one, too. Mm -hmm. I read 
Secret Life of Bees. What did you think of it? I liked it. Yeah. Uh -huh. What did you like about it? Um, I, I don't know. I was able to relate to a lot of it. I mean, just, mm -hmm. yeah, but I thought it was a, I don't know, an eye opener. Yeah. As far as what the little girl went through. Yeah, it's pretty good. Good. Any other books floating around, you guys? I remember reading? Sometimes they gave you stuff in high school and you, and you hate reading it. That was my situation with a few things as well. But, I, but uh, the stuff that matters is the stuff that you go out and pursue yourself. That's the stuff that's going to stick with you in terms of literature. Um, if you never walked into a bookstore and bought a book, you should. Or downloaded one, uh, which is how most people are reading now, you should. Um, it's, it's, as, it's as basic as eating your vegetables, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of professional life. So um, that's, that's what I have to say. All right, thank you very much for your attention this morning. I, I appreciate you listening so well, and I hope that I made some sense. Thank you, Ed. Thank you.